With everything you have on your plate, earning your degree online seems impossible. But at Grand Canyon University, we specialize in helping you fit a master's degree in education into your busy day. Your graduation team, led by your own GCU counselor, provides you with the personal support you need to succeed. Achieve your goals with a plan and team behind you. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu. Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey, everyone. I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD experts broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very pleased to be talking with Dr. Lori Maitland about skills that high school students need to learn before they graduate. Dr. Maitland has long experience coaching college students and other individuals with learning and attention differences, and she has observed that students who learn to advocate for themselves while they're still in high school are much more likely to succeed both in college and in life in general after high school. So today she's going to help us understand how we as parents can help our children learn to ask effectively for what they need to succeed and cope with setbacks when they occur. Let me introduce Teresa Maitland to you. She is a PhD who's been in the field of education for over 40 years, working in a wide variety of programs with people of all ages with learning and attention differences. In addition to coaching hundreds of college students over the years, she's also co-authored one of the first books published on the topic of coaching college students and, more importantly, perhaps co-authored a coaching training program to teach others how to coach college students. And she's also participated in several research studies investigating the impact of coaching on undergraduates, including those with ADHD and LD. So she's a perfect person to tell us how to coach our high school students to get them ready for college. Let me thank the sponsor of this webinar, Play Attention. Play Attention is a comprehensive learning program available for both children and adults designed to strengthen executive functions, self-regulation, and all the skills that are critical for success in everyday lives. Play Attention can customize a program for your teen or for you to develop essential life skills. Call 800-788-6786. That's 800-788-6786 for more information on customized programs from Play Attention as well as their personal executive function coaching program with unlimited support. Their URL is playattention.com, and I cannot recommend them highly enough. With that, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Maitland, and thank you again for being here with us today. Well, I want to thank you so much, Susan and Janice and Wayne from Attitude. I always love the opportunity to collaborate with you. In the time that we're together, what we're going to do is um, talk about the, what, what does it mean to self-advocate, what are self-advocacy skills, and why are they important, and what are the barriers in teens with learning and attentional differences, what are the barriers that they have in learning these skills, and then more importantly, I know the main thing that you're on the webinar for is some ideas on how to develop those skills, and I'm going to use some real-life examples from my work with college students, Um, and as Susan said, um, from my experience, and I spent 24 of my 40 years at a college setting and also during that time coached a lot of college-bound teens. So from my own direct experience working with young people, I've seen self-advocacy skills make or break a person's uh, college experience and make a big difference once they're in the world if they do or don't have them. Um, so as I've researched this skill, it's interesting to see that a lot is written about self-advocacy when it comes to people with disabilities, and it seems like it's part of the bigger disability rights movement that started way back in the 60s, but I would assert that this is a skill that we all need, that we all need, and and I don't know how you were taught it. (laughs) I didn't have good role models for it, Um, but it's a critical skill for all teens, even and young people, even if they don't have diagnoses, and it's just, this definition is is quoted a lot in uh, references, so I I put this one up there. It's really simple, right? It is the ability to speak up and articulate what you need. And I added assertively because sometimes people speak up in a non-assertive way, either a whiny way or an angry way or a passive way, but it really is articulating assertively what one needs. 
and then using what you know about your needs to make really good decisions about what supports or modifications or resources would help you meet those needs. And of course, making this decision isn't enough. And also, I think a good self-advocate has to seek out those supports. And although this sounds really simple, while I'm talking, I hope you'll think about in your life, think of a time where you have or haven't self-advocated. And think of all the component skills that are a part of this. It's really hard. As Susan said, this is hard for all of us to do proactively or sometimes at all, because it really does require that we have, first of all, an awareness that we have a need, and that could be a global awareness of our strengths and weaknesses. And if we have that global awareness, we know that certain weaknesses are going to bump up against certain situations. But it's also that in-the-moment awareness, like how do we know when we have a need? It's hard to know that sometimes that feeling of anger or frustration or hopelessness is a need being communicated to us. And then if we notice that we have a need, there has to be some acceptance in us that it's okay to ask about it and not a shame or embarrassment um, or guilt about having a need that we have to ask someone in the environment to help us. And that step of actually verbalizing it, it, I really think it takes tremendous courage to do. Um, And then also a belief that it's going to make a difference. If you've had a, if you feel hopeless and you know what your need is, you're you're not going to be able to to get it out there in the world. And then think of all the communication skills that we have to have to actually um, find the right person, talk to them, and and in that dynamic interaction where we're actually trying to get our needs met, um, we have lots of things can happen where people might not understand or agree with us. So it takes a lot of self management of our listening skills and our feelings, and then depending on the outcome, right, we also have to have the skills to handle the outcome because the best case scenario is, right, that people agree and we get what we need, but that doesn't always happen in life or in in schools or in college. Um, Sometimes we have to compromise and negotiate, and sometimes we get a no, and we have to know whether what we're asking is reasonable. and doesn't step on the needs of other people. Um, If we know the laws of the environment that we're in, we can decide is that no, really uh, someone not following the laws, or is that an okay no, and do we have to come to grips with it? So as as we just think of our own lives, we know that this is a very tough skill, but it's critical. And And I know you wouldn't be on the webinar if you didn't think it was critical, but I thought I would just point out three reasons why we really want this to be a strategic skill that we teach our young people. And in fact, when I've been asked what's one skill that we could teach teenagers that would increase their likelihood of success, I have oftentimes said having um, being a strong self-advocate. So I would just highlight again, as you're listening and thinking about your own life, think of the countless situations in life that have nothing to do with disability where you have had to self-advocate, take, or you wished you had in your family, with friends, in a work setting. If you've ever had a family in our healthcare situation or you've been in it and you haven't understood what the doctors were saying, um, how about when you've received bills that have wrong charges or you've had services that have gone wrong? I thought about, as I was putting this together, I recently did renovations in my house with a big box store in my area and pretty much everything that could go wrong did. And when we don't have self-advocacy skills, those stressors, when things don't go well, can just pile on us, right? And if we have the tools to advocate for ourselves effectively, it changes our whole ability to have a successful life. And it has nothing to do with the diagnosis. It's just a critical skill to feel empowered in life. But I do want to point out, it isn't just my observations, that have led me to believe this is a good skill, an important skill. There actually is a body of research that links self-advocacy to success in college. And it it goes like this. There there has been research that looks at individuals with learning and attentional disabilities and, and looks at what factors seem to sort out the people who get, get to the end and graduate from those who don't, or from those who take a very long time to graduate. 
And what researchers have found is that early use of college resources seems to be a key to success in college. Um, and when people have looked at those individuals who do early use of resources, what they've learned is that those teens or young adults have had previous practice before they entered a college setting, being their own advocate and using resources before they got to college. Makes a lot of sense, but it is really true that if um, somebody has left their senior year having run their IEP meeting or their 504 plan meeting, um, individualized educational plan meeting, or even handle their own communications in the school, they're more likely to have that ability the first week of class. Um, there's also a big body of research on, on just retention and graduation for all students. And I thought I would share this because I think this is also interesting and points out why this is a skill for everybody um, who might be college bound. That there's research that shows if, in, if students make authentic one-on-one -on -one mentoring type of relationships with any at least one college um, personnel, it could be a faculty, it could be an advisor, it could be a coach, a learning center person, that that improves their retention rate. And retention refers to the, that you come back the next year. And then it also, which I left off the slide, is also is linked to better graduation rates. So as I said, it's not just my observations or um, maybe you're, you're thinking, but there's research to support us in this. And then, of course, future life is going to demand that the young adults that we're raising, not you, not their parents or not the professionals, they have to become the point of contact, um, especially in the college setting. If, if you haven't already learned this, um, in the college setting, there are laws that they, college personnel can't talk to parents unless their teens sign a release. Um, so the game changes <laughs> in the college world. Um, so the expectation is that your young person is the one that everybody should talk to. Um, and there are actually even the laws that govern, govern accommodations require that the young person come forward, not their parent, and disclose their documentation and their disability. And then pretty much every office on campus um, expects the young person, not their parent, to make the appointment and to show up. And although attitudes are softening toward parents joining young people at their meetings, more often the culture at most colleges is that people just don't expect parents to be calling the professor. Um, and depending on the professor's attitudes, that could close the door or that can close attitudes. Um, if they've had to, if they've had to help their young person advocate, then sometimes they're maybe understanding. And then let's just think about in the world of work. I know I've read some articles on the internet about how helicopter parenting has has crossed the line into the world of work, and that there are stories of parents joining their young people, and these are people without disabilities, at their at their interviews <laughs> to negotiate their salary, or even contacting their employers when there's a problem. And certainly that's not going to be in the teen's best interest. And we hate to think about it, but the day will come where the young person won't have their skilled parent who's become a great advocate to do all the advocating for them. So if I haven't convinced you already, I'm sure um, you're, you're going to be with me. But, you know, it is an odd paradox here because although we know this is a really, really critical skill, unfortunately... The teens that we're talking about who do have diagnoses have lots of factors that are part of their differences that make this really hard. You know more than I do that when you have somebody who has an attentional, learning, emotional, or social difference and they have poor executive functioning skills, it, it makes it hard for them to reflect accurately on what their need is and turn it into a verbalization that they could articulate effectively. And then to stay with it, and stay focused on it enough to persist. And then many times, what I saw in a college setting is the parents had gone through the grief cycle and accepted the disability, but the young person had not. And I met many students who were facing for the first time the pain that they really did have a difference and they really struggled with acceptance. And until you're at acceptance and you kind of like yourself and you see your disability maybe as a gift, right, that being able to even talk about it can become hard. 
I don't think we talk enough either about how the basic personality of the individual who has a difference can impact how it manifests itself. You know, these disabilities can sit in people who are by nature introverts or by nature extroverts or somewhere in the middle. And um, if you are an introvert, you understand that asking for help and sharing your personal struggles is not is really challenging when you're a more private person who likes to, as a learning style, maybe figure things out yourself. Um, and that if you're an extrovert, it can go the other way. Like sometimes extro extroverts can ask for help all the time where they're not aware that they're demanding all the resources in the room or in the family. Um, Many times the young people we are talking about have had some really valid negative experiences in the world where people didn't believe they had a difference because they look like everybody else um, or it didn't go well. And then they can create, it can create this like sense of hopelessness. Like why even bother asking? Nobody's going to, they don't want to do the things that I need. Um, so instead of becoming assertive and productive, um, young people with these differences are really at risk for becoming really passive and dependent, or they can go the other way and become very aggressive or demanding and reactionary. And it actually can, those extremes can exist in the same person, that finally when their fuse is blown, they started passive and then they get frustrated. So what I want us to point out is as a result, I think even though this is a challenge. These skills are hard to teach to individuals with learning differences. We adults can really play a big role. If we take over um, all the self-advocating, then we have the potential to be part of the problem. And what I really wanted to share is that I met hundreds of students in the 24 years I spent at a college setting. And what struck me and why I'm talking to you today is that I met students who had the same sort of disabilities, and yet one one student had exceptional self-advocacy skills and the other didn't. And that's where I want to tell you a story. This is where I've, cre I've taken to real-life examples of students I met, and to protect their identity, I've changed their names and I've tweaked the details a little. But pretty much these two young women uh, represent the contrast in self-advocacy that I met constantly at college that got me on my journey to learn why, like what's the difference that makes some people have these skills and some not. So once upon a time, there really were two college freshmen that I met in the same year, um, Ashley and Ann. Ashley came to college with strong self-advocacy skills and Ann didn't. And what's interesting is these two young women really are interesting to me and they made me really start learning because they had very similar learning differences and educational histories and even family backgrounds. But because Ashley came to college with smoother with a with lots of skills, she had a much smoother transition. She would never tell you it was easy, but she it was smoother and Anne's adjustment was rocky. So let me just share a little bit about Ashley and Anne so that you can see what I mean. And um, Ashley stands out because of, she demonstrated the number of behaviors that I hardly ever saw in college, in college students. Once she was accepted to the university, um, and that usually they get that contact either in January or sometime in uh, April, once she got her acceptance letter, she, not her mother, called me to actually arrange some meetings before she started um, on campus in the fall to really learn more about the resources. And when I was thinking about their stories, I was thinking, isn't it interesting? I, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of students I met in 24 years, but I can count on one hand the students who did what Ashley did, where they called me and they reached out. Um, certainly, I had hundreds of calls from parents who did this at this point. And what Ashley did that was also distinctive is when we actually finally had our, our meeting, um, Ashley and her mom came back to my office together, but Ashley led the meeting. And I was later to learn that Ashley was really an introvert, and this was not her nature. And I will share later how her mom got her to this point. But Ashley wanted the meetings because she had very accurate self-awareness. She was aware that she was an introvert and this change from a small high school to a campus with 
um, 4,000 in her freshman class and classes as big as 400 was going to tax her. Um, she also was concerned. She wanted to know what resources there might be if she had some emotional issues while she transitioned. Um, she was concerned she'd have a really hard time finding her group that had her values and wondered. Uh, we offered coaching, and she wondered if our coaching could include goals to find a group and to make friends, not just academics. And when it came to academics, she was really concerned. She had done very well in her high school with lots of accommodations, lots of uh, tutoring and learning strategy instruction, but she knew she was a very slow reader, and she relied on audio books. Um, and she wanted to be certain, like, how could she get those audio books? What office on campus did she have to register with for extended time and audio books? And seriously, all these questions were coming from Ashley. So you get the picture that it wasn't a surprise that Ashley came weekly to see me her whole freshman year. And as I said, if she was on this webinar with us, she would tell you that adjustment was, it rocked her boat, and it was one of the hardest things she ever faced. But because she had a coach, she used counseling, she went to the writing center, she talked to professors. She ended that year having um, almost all Bs in spite of taking a foreign language, which was frightening to her. And all of her self-advocacy skills had her connect really early. Um, and she chose to do it, not her mom. So on the other hand, Anne, is, Anne had a very different story. I never met Anne until January after her first semester when she got on academic probation. Interestingly enough, though, I heard about Anne. Anne was on my husband's caseload. He's an academic advisor at the university. And her parents came and met with him without Anne to see what he could do to help pick some classes that Anne would, would not struggle in with her attention and reading disabilities. He immediately told them about our resources and they, they were not ready to hear that because Anne really didn't use individual help in her high school. She had a lot of accommodations. And they described that they had worked with the teachers to have reduced um, reading assignments, have Anne never have to read out loud in front of a class. They also had Anne have extensions on all of her papers that were hard for her to do. And all of these things were negotiated and made Anne successful. Um, by the time I met Anne, um, she was more open to coming to our office and came with her family, but she really didn't talk. Her parents did the talking. And she did start coming weekly, but the truth was at the point I met her, her self-esteem and her, her feelings of embarrassment because she had done so poorly um, were bigger than her learning differences at that point. She uh, admitted to me that when she made some mistakes, she missed a couple tests because she didn't have good time management. She just got hopeless and quit going to class. We uncovered that really at the point I met Anne, she was really depressed. And, and um, with the help of the counseling center on campus, Anne and her family made the decision to withdraw Anne from the semester and give her time to um, heal, really, to get her depression dealt with, to help her learn more about her learning differences so that she could come back in a better situation. So this, this story kind of indicates some different parenting styles. And in the book that I was blessed to co-author with Dr. Patricia Quinn, we use the metaphor of piloting the plane to talk about different parenting styles. And if we just look at Ashley, um, and we'll contrast her with Anne, Ashley's parents took an approach which we would call co-piloting versus Anne's parents who were operating like pilots of Anne's life. So in Ashley's situation, and I should mention that I got very close to both girls and their families, and I interviewed them to try to understand for my own learning, like how could two girls with such similar issues end up having such different experiences? And, and this simplifies what I learned, but Anne's parents would agree that they played a big role in not preparing her to be her own self-advocate. Um, Ashley's mom shared that it, as soon as Ashley was diagnosed in kindergarten and then again in second grade, although Ashley was very emotional about having these diagnoses. She and the family talked openly about Ashley's differences. And Ashley indicated, Ashley's mom indicated that 
as often as possible, she got the psychologist or the pediatrician to talk to Ashley at her level and to help her understand her differences and frame them in a positive manner. And certainly as a family, they didn't over-focus on their differences. They built her talents, too. But they didn't hide them, where Anne's parents, because of Anne's reaction to the diagnosis, or maybe their own feelings about it, kind of kept it under a rug and minimized it so that it robbed Anne of opportunities to really own and accept that difference. Ashley's mom happened to be a special education teacher, so she might have had some extra training about how important this was. But she talked about starting at a very young age, gradually involving Ashley in all interactions, all the way back to actually elementary school. Because of Ashley's shyness and introversion, she would come home when she didn't understand something on a worksheet and ask her mother to help her. And her mom would say, why didn't you ask the teacher? And she didn't want to ask the teacher. And instead of starting to tutor her herself, she would help Ashley and say, we're going to go to school tomorrow morning and I'll be with you, but let's go talk to Mrs. Smith. She's a really nice person and she can explain it better than I. So she started very small and then gradually invited Ashley to be a part of any school meeting for just a few minutes. And she told me that many times educators were not open to this idea, um, even IEP meetings. But mom kind of promoted that it was critical for Ashley to um, have the chance slowly to learn how to talk to teachers, how to describe her struggles, how to suggest things that she thought would help her. And actually, her mom did this really brave thing in senior year. She actually made the commitment that she was going to make Ashley practice being in college. And what that meant is she and Ashley agreed that mom would have no communications in the school and Ashley would have them all. But mom's role was co-piloting. She was in the background helping Ashley prepare for every school interaction, helping her um, debrief it if it didn't go well and problem solve how to go back and, and, and continue advocating. As opposed to, as you heard, Anne's parents did all the communication, as did the teachers, and problem solving. Ashley's mom understood that as her right, she could have gotten a lot of environmental changes for Ashley that would have made life easier for her. But she was always very cautious to balance too many in, uh, accommodations with Ashley learning how to manage things. So although Ashley had extensions on assignments, she and her mom... Um, pushed the school to have resource help to teach Ashley better time management and better writing skills so that it wasn't always needed that she had to have extensions. Ash Anne's parents really saw later with 2020 hindsight that they never really had those opportunities for Anne to go to a tutor to get the help. Um, if they did have a tutor, it was them at home, but they really pushed the school for lots of environmental changes. And you can see, uh, finally, Ashley's mom and family, they were really proactive and strategic about the long-term reality, um, where Anne's parents were not. And let me just say, I am not judging Anne's parents, and um, I understand because I have an enabling kind of personality, and I know how hard it is when you have someone you love and you see them struggling, but I think lots of times that love may blindside people and not let them see the long-term impact that um, doing all the advocating um, is doing. Now, this slide makes you think it's all the parents' fault, right? But let me say, as you're sitting there, I'm thinking, you're probably saying to yourself, Teresa, you don't understand my team. I want to co-pilot with them, and they, they won't. And I understand because I did meet lots of young people whose parents brought them to our office and they refused to come. Um, and, it, and I know I don't have any easy answers for really, really resistant teens. But I do have some thoughts for us to think about. Um, when you have a really, really resistant teen who won't own their difference and won't ask for help and won't use the resources, um, the top priority, I think, needs to be your self-care so that you are not overly stressed and you kind of catch yourself if you're by accident piloting their planes. I think it's really critical for us to try to help those young people figure out what's causing the resistance and getting some help for them. Sometimes it really is a lack of full understanding of their differences and an acceptance and a shame 
about it. Sometimes there's a coexisting emotional issue like depression, anxiety, social anxiety that makes it really hard or being on the autism spectrum um, that may also be there. And I would urge you to work in your area to find a third party um, that can help you with your team because sometimes what happens is the rebellion between of teens against their parents uh, makes them not be willing to listen to you, but a third party like a good therapist, counselor, or coach could maybe help them open their minds to advocate for themselves. And there may be times where a family counselor might actually encourage you to use a tough love approach. Um, I don't know your child, and I don't know that that's what he or she needs, but you might talk with a therapist. I have met some families, and when I say tough love, I've met families who have said to their young person starting in ninth or 10th grade that we noticed that you have a hard time asking for help and you don't want to use your resources. I think for us to invest in college, will you in three or four years or two years, we need to see that you're facing yourself and you're getting help. Um, I've also met families who um, young people like Anne didn't make it. And they actually said to them, if we're going to invest back to put you back in school, we need you to commit to being in counseling or to using the resources. And there's all sorts of ways that sometimes we have to give a little nudge for that young person to open up. So as we, as we come to a close of my part before the Q&A, I just want to say um, the coach in me wants to coach you to say it's a new year. It's a perfect time. No matter how challenging your young person is, change is always possible. And if you are piloting the plane and you're stuck in that role, you could begin to just talk to your young person about the fact that things are going to have to be different this year, and you could blame this webinar. And, and when we're co-piloting, we always collaborate. So we could give choices, like is there one teacher your young person would feel more comfortable asking for help from versus others? Baby steps. Anything's better than you piloting their plane all the time. And then to think about what is it in you that's making you pilot and what do you need to stop piloting? If you are more like Ashley's family, how could you raise the ante? Um, and how could you uh, give over more control? Could they run their own IEP meeting? Or could they come the last part or the first part to talk about what, um, what accommodations helped and what didn't? Just kind of raise the bar a little bit. And finally, I always like to leave stories on a happy ending. And not all stories I understand of young adults end as happily as these two girls did. But the truth is, both Ashley and Anne, their dreams came true. Um, Ashley graduated in four years. She never got on academic probation. She graduated with fairly, really good grades. And her first job out of college was a as a middle school teacher for young people with learning differences. And a couple years ago, she called me to say she has a relative who owns a camp, and they've been talking about maybe turning that camp or part of it into an outdoor adventure experience for kids with learning differences, and she's considering going back for an MBA to maybe be in a business role at that camp. Um, she credits the struggle she had uh, learning to advocate for herself to opening her mind that anything is possible. And Anne's story also ended positively. It took Anne longer. It actually took her five and a half years to graduate. She came back a second time to try to do her best and wasn't ready yet and took another uh, leave of absence. But eventually she came back and came regularly for help. She ended up being a peer coach in our office and actually the office that handles retention and um, that means students who are on academic probation, she actually volunteered there to uh, give hope to people who got on probation like she did her freshman year. Um, when she did graduate, she actually decided she wants to be a clinical psychologist working with young people with learning differences. So on that happy note, let me make sure I'm at the end of my story. I, we're going to save that till the end. So now I really want to give you a chance and open us up for questions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was fascinating, and I love the, the, the profiles of the two students. <sighs> Lots of questions here, many of which come back to, how do I do this? <laughs> Let me just try one from Annette. She said, I have an eighth grader, which is interesting because 
she's got time, you know, who struggles with math and his school offers after school math support. But my son will not go to it. I've tried every, over and over again to encourage him to use these, these services and I can't get him to do it. What's your advice? Well, it, I would first ask him why. I would kind of want to find out, like, what is it about going that, um, and I'm assuming he sees it as a sign of failure um, mm -hmm. or uh, a negative thing. And, and many times just using a resource in our society, you're seeing as something only people with problems do, rather, um, than people that gets the way of life for adults. Like, we all have to use resources. I wonder, short of mandating that you have to go, right, I wonder mm -hmm. if there's a way to create an incentive to go. Uh, what kind of reward system would would work for your young person? I think you, we have to help them understand why it's worthwhile to go. And like I said, you could use this webinar as an example. Um, if he or sh if she has um, older siblings or cousins who are in college, that could come and, and give a little bit of a pep talk about how important learning to use tutors and, and asking for help is. Sometimes that can shift somebody's perspective, but sometimes they actually need a reward to try it. I wonder, again, when, when, do, you know, when do you say that let's go together? At least we're going to go one time together. I want you to meet the tutor and let's at least go talk to them. Because um, sometimes that, that step going by yourself is overwhelming. Many of the families mm -hmm. that connect with their young person to me realize that they would never come by themselves, but they came with them for their first several meetings. Um, I, again, I, I hate to sound like sometimes we might, if the grades are really bad in math, and math is really an area of need, is it possible to, to say this is something that's non-negotiable? That right. Let's, like, how do we do it first in a positive way, <laughs> and first with rewards and trying to open their minds, and then how do we do it in small steps so that it won't be so intimidating? Is there a way to ask the math tutor to reach out to your young person to invite them and say, "I really want to work with you"? Like, how do you design like the situation to entice them? But there are times that's when I say a tough love approach. Like, you know, for example, in college, in some classes, if you get a D, you have to go to tutors. Right. No the choice. Yeah. 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 yeah the, the professor requires it. But um, I think, again, examining why and what his, what his what's going on. Is, yeah. And, and is it shame? And how do we take that away by modeling that we go for help? I think, you know, you raised a really good point about in the Ashley versus um, Anne discussion about being comfortable having the disability, and um, that seems like something that underlies many people's different approaches to asking for help because asking for help by definition assumes that you recognize you, you have something that you need help with and you don't feel ashamed about it. Can you talk some more about how parents can, can address that issue of differences and shame um, and what ages they should should start to do that? Well, what's coming to me as, as you're asking me this, I'll, I'll get to the parent point, but I think it's a societal issue. Mm -hmm. And I think right. that I wish that we could influence our schools to have resources for everyone. And let, let me, I'll, I'll get back to the parents in a second, but for example, our learning center that I worked for at UN, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill at one point had a very bad stigma that it was only for people who were failing or on probation or um, people with diagnoses, and nobody wanted to use it. Um, we had a new director come in about 12 years ago, and she tried to spin that whole thing differently. Um, she started a campaign finding some uh, successful students who were willing to use the learning center and successful students who want to get in med school or they, they have Bs but they want As, and then use those students to, to be the spokespeople in classes to talk about the fact that the Learning Center is for everybody. When Michael Jordan went to college, he didn't stop having a coach. We all need learning and coaching. So I do think what 
the problem that I saw at the college level is most of the high school students never had a school that had resources for everybody. Um, they were only for people with problems. And that doesn't help us as parents, um, right, try to promote it. But I think some schools are moving in the direction that there are tutors for everybody, not just for people with bad grades. Um, That's a really interesting know. concept because recently we had a wonderful speaker who talked about how to raise children with, who are neurotypically different. And one of the questions was, how should I address sibling issues? And and her answer was that everyone needs help. And your family culture should be that whether you're the person with a disability or not, everyone in our family takes advantage of help when they need it. So it's sort of what you're saying, that this isn't something that's just for those who have a specified disability um, and I, I just want to say how successful this attitude shift was is that at, at the point that I left in January, um, our learning center was seeing 25% of the undergraduate population who came voluntarily. And, wow. Um, so, yeah, and I would say we see we were seeing scholars, we were seeing people who, and we were seeing people who were on probation. That they we made all sorts of services that were fun too, that mm -hmm. people want to come to. But I think back to how do we help a young person come to acceptance? Um, I do think that having conversations with someone, and if it won't be with you, who could it be? Like, is there an older sibling or is there someone in the family that has a, the same diagnosis that could sit and have a discussion with the young person to frame it um, that is normal. People have these things, and for me, it's a gift now in my life. I've often wanted to put the adults that I coach together with the elementary school kids that I was meeting because the adults that I coached were in amazing jobs in the world. They were struggling with maybe reading and time management, but they could give hope to elementary school people. There's actually a great organization called Eye to Eye which is mm -hmm. a mentoring program that takes successful college students and brings them into elementary schools to try to get the stigma away. So I do think having some role models that they could look up to that could um, inspire them and talk to them. But then sometimes there does need to be therapy or counseling to deal with the pain and the grief. Uh, there's, you really have to face for young people. It's hard. It's, you are different, but different isn't bad. And what are your gifts? So I think there are books that are out there, um, children's books. There are young adult books. There are people who specialize in dealing with this acceptance process in young people. But there's also creative things. Like I said, having um, family members be willing to talk. And too often we're focusing on the weakness all the time. And I wonder if sometimes that's part of the problem, that they're in tutoring, they're mm -hmm. in coaching. They're getting accommodations. How can we balance it and focus on their unique talents and gifts? And sometimes the gifts are directly from these differences um, to build self-esteem. Uh, and I think we have to look at the parents. Like Anne's parents would tell you they had not fully accepted her differences. Interesting. Right. Like are you seeing it as a, as a curse versus a blessing? Um, there's so many layers to why someone might not accept it. Oftentimes they don't understand it and it's, they don't realize it's not their fault and it doesn't mean they're not smart or that they, and that doesn't mean they won't have a great life, but we mm -hmm. have to show them examples of people who have those great lives. Um, recently I did a workshop for a high school and I found, I found videos and interviews with people like Jennifer Aniston and Michael Phelps and, um, um, the singer from Maroon 5, whose name is escaping me, all owning their difference and talking mm -hmm. about their struggles and what a gift it was. Yep. No, I think that's true. That's, that's um, something. So um, there are a number of, of questions here which relate to, I think, what you're describing as perhaps needing therapists, and that is teens, teens who just absolute point blank refuse. As one person says, I can make them go to the tutor, but I can't force them to engage. And another person says, my daughter um, won't discuss it. She just says no, and that's it. And her answer to anything is, you're forcing me, and I won't do it. No. So those are sort of really resistant 
kids. Yeah, are, are, yeah. Did I hear you correctly suggesting in those cases you need a third party or someone else to be involved? Well, yes, and I well, I do think that um, many parents tried to force their young person to come to coaching with me, mm-hmm. and that that wouldn't work. Like they would want me to email them afterward to prove that their young person came, um, yeah. and we got we got nowhere, right? So mm-hmm. sometimes the, the parent needs help on mm. how do you, how do you manage this. And when do you let natural consequences happen? Because sometimes mm-hmm. people are resistant, but they've never experienced the consequence of their decisions because we are oftentimes there propping them up or doing the advocating for them. So lots of families I worked with with resistant people tried to get help themselves to figure out how do I cope and where am I part of the problem? And right. how can I lo- lovingly let go and let them have some consequence that might open their minds. Uh, And truly, you can't make somebody be open in a therapy session, but you could go get therapy on how do you stop getting in a power struggle. Right. That's that's really interesting. interesting. Yeah. In a situation where you're up against, the the ones I just read that people have posted where you're up against a child who absolutely won't engage, clearly you need some other advice, either you or somebody, right? I mean, just... Beating your head against that wall is not going to work. So I was just going to say the therapist or whoever you're going to might help you figure out a way to give that young person options. Like mm-hmm. sometimes they won't do a therapist, but they would do a coach or they would do a tutor. Um, um, sometimes a therapist can get through to a very resistant person that is fighting their parent. Sometimes not. Um, right. and sometimes it does take a natural consequence, like, um, I did meet some very resistant teens who refused help, and they did become ineligible at college. And that is hard to let that happen for your young person because you love them. But that, sometimes that is what it took for someone to open their mind that their parents were right, mm-hmm. that they mm-hmm. do have a difference, and it would be easier to navigate with help. That's why right. I said there's no easy answers, and you need help because that person's going to um, test you for years to come, and you want to, <laughs> right. you want to make sure that you're part of you're part of the solution, and you're living your life, and you're taking care of you, and not part of the problem. Mm-hmm. To your point about moving from pilot to from pilot to co-pilot, which I think is a great image. There are a couple of questions here about that transition. So one person says, for younger children, what's a good age to switch from pilot to co-pilot and how do you make it? And then another person similarly says, how would would you get a fourth grader involved in an SIT meeting? So I guess the question is, how, when does that transition start? And can you describe some of the, the ways parents can make that transition happen? It's a really good question. And I don't know that it's a when, but it's a how. I actually do think that at all ages, we could start co-piloting. And all Mm -hmm. that would mean is that, for example, if a child is having trouble learning learning spelling, um, instead of just sending them to some specialist for help, we rarely say to them, you're having trouble spelling. What do you think would help you? We don't, we don't collaborate. And what co-piling really means is don't make the decisions without the input of the young person, no matter what age. And how could we just ask them? Like, so I know, you know, this this subject has been hard for you. Um, we want it to go better this year. What do you think will help? And what role do you think, like, what do you need me to do? And what could you start doing that I'm doing? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. if I'm the one stuffing your your homework in the folder every night because you forget it. <laughs> Let's stop that. And, and again, I'm, I'm trying to say it's not so much an age. It's sort of like an, a, it's an approach that could start at any age where mm-hmm. your young person and you decide that, um, and we're going to stay with this idea of talking to the school. Like um, in the past, perhaps the parent has always answered the calls from the school and gone to the meeting. We could stay to a second grader, a third grader, a fourth grader. There's a school meeting, and it's about you, and I'd like you to be a part of it. Um, What do you think? Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't want to go, how about if you tell me what questions you want me to ask? And this whole co-pilot approach is like collaboration, 
Um, and it might actually be picking, as I said during the presentation, kids usually have more than one teacher. And they might not feel comfortable asking questions of all of them because some may be more stern than others. So we might say this year, let's pick one teacher where you're going to do more of a discussion and asking of questions and, and you're going to talk with me with them. Which one, now that you've been in school two weeks, which one do you think you'd feel more comfortable uh, coming to meetings with? And if you don't want to be at the whole meeting, what about the first five minutes? And let's rehearse at home. And that's where Ashley's mom did such a great job. She would make Ashley rehearse at home before they went to the meeting. What are you going to say in the meeting? Because it was hard for Ashley as an introvert. What questions are you going to ask? And if you get stuck, I'll be there to help you. But it's that collaborative approach that's baby steps where we actually start asking the young person, what do you think would help you? Let's have you practice asking for what you want. And if it's hard for you to do, let's rehearse it. Um, wow. Yep. It's a whole different approach. Than, and many times schools don't want the young person in the meeting because they, they feel uncomfortable talking about them in front of them. Um, but I think, again, anything that just moves the young person to be sharing that role with their parent. And the question, like, what do you think, um, what steps could you take this year? What do you need from me to help you take those steps? And I'm here for you. I'm not going to abandon you. But I want us, by the time you're a senior, to be doing more on your own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess you're right. It's sort of an approach that could start, start at the earliest age, really, um, rather than telling people uh, focusing on um, telling your child, focusing on involving your child in what the solution is. Um, there are a couple of questions here which are similar, which are very interesting, which are about ch- uh, parents of children who, who, who just, I guess, in the perspective, from the perspective of the parents are just denying reality. So, um, my child, my son refuses to go help for his teachers because he doesn't think he needs help. He's got it under control. We don't know how to combat that, even with the fact that his grades say otherwise, that he doesn't have it under control. Or, um, another person whose child, um, wants to do absolutely everything and doesn't see any reason why they can't manage all activities and all things, even though their executive function problems make it very difficult um, for them to get everything that they'd like to get done. So these are two parents of children who just don't see the problem, <laughs> I guess is how they would describe it. Or right, right. Won't, admit it, won't admit to the problem, say that they have it all under control. Right. Well, I wonder, again, is this a situation where you can converse with your young person and have a productive discussion? Because it might take them telling you, why they feel that way and what evidence they have for their argument and you telling them why you feel differently and what evidence you have. Now, if it becomes a battle, that's where sometimes a third party Mm -hmm. is needed who could help the young person see the facts. Unfortunately, none of us are really accurate, self-aware people, but especially people with learning differences, they don't remember that maybe there were four times that they got bad grades. They're only remembering Um, the one time it worked out. So I I think that sometimes staying in a logical place and just kind of saying, okay, let's put it on a whiteboard. What are your facts that make Mm -hmm. you think? And here's my facts and here's the discrepancy. And if that's not easy to do without a third party, that's where uh, coaches and therapists can really be helpful to help the young person who's who's being inaccurate to see see that they're missing something. Um, It's a lot of evidence and communication, and also just looking at, are you actually bailing them out so that they don't have any evidence of problems? Ah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because sometimes we bail them out and we prevent the failure so they don't ever have that bad grade. Uh, We we come in in the minute and we ask the IEP to now have a different accommodation so the failure won't happen. But these are all important, really complicated things, and I'm so glad we've had such a great audience. Oh, they really, they're grappling with all the issues that you're describing. I mean, I think on it, people are on a daily basis. Um, Two people have said that their children have either expressive language disorders or in some way 
have a very difficult time expressing their feelings or their their needs. What would you suggest in that situation where, you know, part of what we're talking about is improving communication and yet communication is is a difficulty for the That's child in question? Yeah. I think about some of the students I met who had either expressive language issues, social anxiety disorder, or autism spectrum students. Mm-hmm. Um, um, actually using a different mode than face-to-face. Like, what about yeah. using email to communicate, mm-hmm. um, and, and to break the ice? We met one student a couple of years ago who had such, he was on the autism spectrum and had ADD. He could not approach people, but he and his mother developed a brochure that described his autism and what he needed and introduced himself, and he handed that out to all of his professors and that then gave him the courage to then go um, email them individually and go to office hours. I think we can How meet interesting. people. Wow. We yeah. can meet people in a different method and explain in that email, because of my language difficulties, I'm not able to come face-to-face, but I'm going to use email to communicate with you. Um, and I've seen people be very successful that way without having the threat of having to think on your feet and express yourself clearly in a meeting, right? Right. That makes so much sense because people oftentimes will be very comfortable texting or emailing who don't want to talk in person or, or on the phone. Certainly not. That's something we hear constantly. So that's that's really an interesting idea. Can I just mention, you have a worksheet on my resource list that Attitude created that's a worksheet that can be filled out to help your young person introduce themselves to their teacher. Um, Mm -hmm. And actually doing that and and having that sent to the teacher by the student or brought rather than discussed, I think those are all ways to work around their difference but still meet the goal of advocating. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a a great idea. Um, So getting them out of the last year of high school, a couple of questions about in the, they're in their senior year in high school. What do you do? What, what's maybe you wish you'd done things sooner, but now you've just got this last year. What's the most important thing that you can do? Well, I, I would want you not to think you only have this last year because you, <laughs> actually, you, you um, because of technology, right, and phones and texting, and many young people in this generation stay in touch with their families in college. In fact, there's some research that says. Kids um, either call or college freshmen call or text their parents three to seven times a week. Um, mm-hmm. It's very common. So don't get the feeling like you have to get it all in senior year if you haven't. But I like this this whole idea of, of collaborating with your young person. And again, if you have communication with your young person and you don't need a third party, you could sit down and just say what you just said. Like, you know what, this is your senior year. College is 12 months away. And I'm wondering what we could do together to help you help you be better prepared as a self-advocate um, or in general. And the books that Dr. Quinn and I created have some college readiness checklist in them that we designed just for this purpose so that a senior or a junior would, would sit down with their parents and evaluate their readiness. But if we stay with just the self-advocacy, we could say, um, you know, when you're in college, I'm not going to be there, and you're going to have to, what what could we do? And collaboratively Mm -hmm. set some goals for the first month of school and and decide together what role does the parent still need to play because the young person isn't ready to take the baton, but what step could the young person take? Um, Any small steps in the direction of learning to ask for help on your own is going to be helpful. Um, and guiding, being guided by the young person's readiness, they are fearful frequently because they don't trust their ability to do it. Um, right. So having a joint decision. And again, if you're in a stalemate with your young person or if it would help you to have a coach guide you through this process, that would be another approach is to have someone who in your community specializes in college readiness, help you make like a game plan. Um, Maybe not just for self-advocacy, but for everything, like waking yourself up, uh, taking your medicine, handling your own homework. So there's a lot you can do, and you're still going to be in the the plane with them in college. Right, absolutely, yeah. it, It can continue. 
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Maitland. This was super helpful. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Good luck with the school year. And thank you to Play Attention as well. Bye, everyone. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com.